Hi, welcome everyone to ATAP's live stream. I'll be your host today. My name is Nick Curtin. I am the chair of the Programs Committee. The Programs Committee with ATAP actually puts on these live streams. And just a little bit about ATAP, the Association of Talent Acquisition Professionals, in case you're not familiar with us. We are a membership that, recommend, sorry, that supports the talent acquisition community. We have over 950 members that are part of us. So we're still continuing to grow. And let me tell you, we are an organization driven by our members. As a part of the programs committee, we look to our members to tell us what they want to hear, who they want to hear from within these live streams. These are meant to be educational, informative, relevant, engaging. So at the end of the day, if we're doing that, <laughs> that's a win for us. And there's a quick hit. We have our sponsors here that we want to give a big shout out to. Greenhouse, Saba, Scout being our platinum members. As you can see, we have a lot of people that are involved in the town acquisition community, both on the technology side um, and all the way through from the sourcing to onboarding. Uh, now, you can engage with us in four main areas. We have atapglobal.org. It's our main website, along with our emails, contact at atapglobal.org. And then, obviously, when it comes to engaging with us, uh, even though it's not in here, we have our LinkedIn page, as well as our Facebook and Twitter. We check those regularly, especially for programming. Uh, so if you want to hit us up, please do so. Let us know how it went. Uh, membership benefits. So like I said, we are a membership driven organization, right? So when you're part of the organization, you're part of the conversation about us driving town acquisition forward to make it a better place, right? You know, there is not a, I don't think there's a more exciting time right now in town acquisition than, than what's going on in the field, the push in diversity and inclusion, the candidate experience, which we'll get to shortly, um, and, and really just everything. So, and being part of ATAP allows you to be a part of those conversations uh, and help really drive those forward. Uh, now, just for everyone's knowledge, we are recording it. So that will, this will go out to everyone along with the slide deck. It'll be in your email. So for all those that have registered, you'll get a copy of the recording and you'll get a copy of this uh, as well. Uh, we are going to do a Q&A session. So that will probably be the last probably five to 10 minutes is a little bit longer uh, of a presentation. Uh, but, you know, without further ado, I would love to introduce our guest speaker today, uh, Michael Goldberg. Uh, Michael is a CEO and founder of Hiring Transformed. He is, his goal, and correct me if I'm wrong, Michael, is really to just to help companies get talent in faster, smarter, and in budget, right? I mean, Michael's been in the field for over 20 years. He's actually a founding member of ATAP, right? And, uh, and just, he's just passionate about the candidate experience. Uh, so without further ado, Michael, take us away. Thanks, Nick, appreciate that. Um, I'm off mute, I assume, yes? Everybody can hear, can you hear me okay, Nick? Tom, Tom, all right, let's go. All right, well, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Michael Goldberg, and uh, I am super excited and honored to be presenting uh, and that ATAP has allowed me to speak with you all about a pretty important uh, topic. You know, a lot of people think that uh, it's really an employer-driven market right now when actually it's not. It's, a, it's still a candidate-driven market, and uh, I can pinpoint to, to several leaders that I've talked with over the last few weeks that will say the same thing, right? Candidates don't, if, they, if they're employed, they don't have to, to move companies. But if you can convince them of so, and for, even for the people that aren't looking, you have to treat your candidates right. The experience matters. And um, so I wanna really kind of just uh, jump, jump right in here. So let's, let's get going. Um, one thing that you wanna do, if you do have questions, just uh, put that in the, uh, in the Q and A section in your menu bar uh, and uh, type that up and uh, we will get that towards the end of the conversation. So about six years ago, a friend of mine did a presentation and when he Googled the words candidate experience, he got about uh, 618 
uh, million you know hits. So what's well actually actually it was there's a slide missing here where there was forty eight thousand six years ago it was forty eight thousand appeared in search results. Now there are over six hundred and eighteen million search results when you type in the word candidate experience. That's how hot and heavy this topic is. So about three weeks ago, I was I did a poll on LinkedIn. It says as a job seeker, have you seen uh, you know candidate have you seen an improvement in recruiter communications for the positions that you uh, apply to? Well, it turns out that uh, that basically things are still the same. They're still saying eighty percent, right, versus twenty percent who have who have since seen a change. That means that there's a pretty serious problem out there, but it's okay, it's fixable. And so today we're gonna to talk to not only the recruiters doing their jobs uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, but also the leaders that have decided to join this call because this is for both uh, parties here. In talking with a, um, someone in education, she goes, yeah, I'm, I'm looking to make a career change and have reached out to recruiters for jobs that are my, that are kind of her target. Um, that she's not really qualified to do, trying to get informational interviews. She's asked for recommendations uh, or others that could get her a seat at the table so she can learn. Um, and really it's been nothing but silence. And that's where, again, there's opportunity. I don't see it as a problem. I see it as an opportunity to be better. And I know it's a big topic right now because what recruiters will, what, what, what the, what recruiting leaders will say to me is, well, we just don't have the time. And there's a slide here. So the worst thing a recruiter can say to a job seeker, nothing, nothing. That's the worst thing you can say is not saying anything. So what's affected? It's really how you see yourself, how others see you, right? It, it affects your personal brand, but really, it affects, sorry about that, it affects your employer brand. And that's what, we're, when we get to this slide, you'll see what that impact is. So, you know, what the heck? Reasons for not improving experience. This was done, I did a survey here, about 120 TA leaders. 33% of them said, we just don't have enough time. I get it. We are being asked to do so much with fewer resources, unless you've been able to staff back up post pandemic, even though the pandemic's not really over, 33% um, say, we just don't know how. 27%, uh, and I thought this was super interesting, felt it was too expensive, too expensive to simply hit a response in your ATS or pick up the phone to call the candidate to let them know we're not moving forward with you or we are moving forward with you as a candidate. And 7%, and this is this struck me, 7% said it's, just, it's not worth the effort. I've got, we've got too much on our plate and we need to move forward. And it's interesting to see, and we should have done a poll to see where you all fall asking the same question. But again, what I hope to do today is show you that there is some time, give you some practical tips on it, where to embed, how to embed communication points in your recruiting process and show you that it's really not that expensive. So can we fix it? Absolutely we can. So what do, what do, what do candidates want? Obviously when you look at this 48% want the position to be able to to, to, to find a position, because that is a part of your candidate experience. Can I go to your career site, find your position and apply for the job without more than two to three clicks? Depending on the ATS you have, there could be some more, there are more, even more clicks than that. 26% or 30% say, I want to see candidates that are responding or the recruiters that are responding quickly, 26% want the application process to be easy, right? 35%, even more on top of that, want the apply process to be quick. And we'll dive into some of these things, but I thought this was, this was interesting. 
So there are five keys to a successful candidate experience, but it all revolves around the nucleus of empathetic communication and follow through. So you could even add the words transparency in there. So it revolves around process, the overall recruiting process, which we're gonna focus a lot of our time on today, the attraction process, the application process, the assessment process, and the interview process. You can even add the onboarding process here if you wanted to, because some uh, recruiting functions are responsible to ensure that onboarding is smooth. So first and foremost, you have to say, well, you know, in, in that, if we go back to that, that uh, slide that says, I don't even know where to begin. The easiest place to begin is your actual recruiting process, right? And then looking at their process, where do you put the candidate touch points? Candidate touch points are where you need to inform the candidate one way or another that they are or are not moving forward in the process. So, like I said, it starts with the job posting, then it moves to the apply process. And each arrow facing up indicates this is where we want the touch process to be. So once they apply, we've reviewed their resume. Let them know if they're not qualified, don't wait till the end of the position is closed and then let them know that you've decided to move forward with somebody else. Let them know then, especially if they aren't qualified. If, if you have pre-qualifying questions that you post out there, which a lot of companies do, which can be done through the ATS, and they don't pass, at least send them an email, whether it's automated or not, to say, thank you for applying. We've looked at your, um, we've looked at your qualifications. Unfortunately, you don't meet the minimum requirements of what we're seeking. Just let them know so that they can move on. We're playing with people's livelihoods. We've all been a candidate before. Next, once you have labeled or gotten your, 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 your targeted list of candidates that you wanna begin the phone screen process with, one of the things that I do as a recruiter when I'm talking to candidates is if I don't think they're qualified and I had a candidate today, we were talking about a, a VP position with certain industry experience. They didn't have that experience. I told them right then and there that, hey, they're really looking for OEM distribution experience. But then I took it a step further. I said, tell me what you're looking for. Let's connect on LinkedIn. How can I help you find a job, right? How can I help connect you to people? Because as an executive, this person was a VP how can I connect him? How can I help him? Go one step further. Go one step further than you normally do. And I get it. It may take five extra minutes of your day, but at least you're trying to help that person. So at the end of the phone screen or during the phone screen, if you really think that they're not a fit, tell them on the phone screen. Tell them right then and there, they're just not a fit. However, you'll keep them open for other positions and Maybe to say, you know, what are some of the things that you're looking for in your next role? You know, if they ask you, how do I get such and such experience? You know, it's that whole chicken and the egg theory. Try to set them up with somebody in the industry that they can talk with and they can gain more insight. Just give them one or two tips that can help lead them on their way so they don't feel like they were dropped like a hot potato. Next is the assessments phase. And we're gonna go into detail of every phase here, right? Um, doing assessments, we'll talk about that. Um, I clearly am against judging candidates based, uh, or cutting candidates off after they've taken an assessment um, because I think the assessment is just a tool in the hiring process. They could be the most qualified candidate of the rule, but if they or, or in the candidate pool, but if they don't meet a minimum score, really, um, or they don't have the exact personality match, really. So, um, as far as the hiring manager interviews go, um, obviously, uh, you you know once you get your feedback again. 
don't wait until they've interviewed. If they're clearly not a fit and it's a hard pass, it's not I'm thinking about it or yes, let's keep them, but it's a hard pass. Ask the manager, hey, in the spirit of candidate or in the spirit of candidate experience, are you okay with me moving on to the next person? And then obviously the offer and the hire and the onboarding process. So let's let's kind of dive in. So the job posting, here you go. Nothing like a Charles Schultz ad. Uh, and Snoopy's one of my favorites. So there you go. But we've all experienced this. Job description says one thing. Get to the interview, completely different. Maybe not completely 180 degrees in difference, but there's some slight irregularities. Right? So attractive job postings need to be easy to find, right? And they need to be able to find them where? Well, if you have them on LinkedIn or any job boards, the apply button should take them right to the position. And really it shouldn't be take them so they have to click apply again. If they're able, it should open up to start the application process. Use storytelling in your job postings. That marketing effect, right? I did a post today on LinkedIn. You can check it out and please vote uh, that says, you know, do job descriptions drive you to apply for a job or not? Last I looked, 90% said yes. And one of the comments was about marketing and storytelling. How do you embed the candidate while they're reading it and make them the hero of the story? Now that's for a whole nother presentation. But that's what you need to do. Highlight career advancement. Talk about it. Be transparent about it. Work with your leaders. So if you're a, if you're a recruiting leader, talk with your talent. Uh, talk with your chief people officer. Get buy-in from the top. We're saying, hey, we want to start showing people that there is a clear path when they come here. If the path's not there, don't lie to them and say, oh, there's great opportunities here. Don't put it in there if it's not going to happen. Right? Express your candidate value proposition. Why should they come work for you? And benefits and foosball tables and free lunches and you know, free this and that, that doesn't count. That's not a value proposition. Comp is not a value proposition. Share interesting projects that you talk about the team and what the candidate and who the team will work with, who you'll work with as a, 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 a bring, bring, those, bring those people to life, mention their first names, right? Disclose your recruiting process. Disclose it. There's a couple of great companies that do that uh, out there. So I'm not gonna read through this, but this is just a sample of, uh, of one that actually uh, if you know Johnny Campbell and his social talent sourcing ninja, uh, I had pulled this because I really loved it. It really did do itself justice. You want to have it just like you want to have an opening pop that you want the candidates to have an opening pop statement to get you interested in them. You want the same thing in your job postings, right? Mighty Oaks, like enterprise customers, start as acorns. And we have some oaks, some acorns, some saplings, all of whom need nurturing to ensure they need to reach their potential. They're looking for an enterprise account manager, right? You'll be based in Dublin, Ireland. You'll, the, the 20 people are split between Dublin and Cork. He mentions Vincent Walter there. Uh, you'll be, here's what you'll be, not what you must have. Here are the requirements that we're looking for, but here's what we're looking, here's what, here's what the ideal candidate is gonna have in their past, right? And then obviously the call to action. So if you have any questions, just type them in the Q&A and we'll be happy to answer them at the end. Um, so, but now let's move on to the applica uh, application. Um, so the talent board in 2019 in the North American Candidate Experience Report said most applications are too long. The ideal length is under 15 minutes. 26% of the applicants who applied in under, in, under 50, in, in, in under 15 minutes in 2018 were recognized as best in practice. What's crucial to note here is that there are applicant tracking systems that candidates will love, right? One of them is a 
is a, is a, I saw a couple of them that are sponsors here. And there's a couple that I'd say if I saw them, if I was applying for a job, because I do like to test the process out and see what tools people are using. But if I, if I see one that has eight to nine steps in the application process and you know exactly who I'm talking about, I click off. I click away. I don't bother applying because I know it's going to be a hassle because the parsing is not what it is. So what are, what are some of the solutions or what is the solution? To me, it's the short application, right? Short application, name, email, phone, upload your resume or your LinkedIn profile. If you have OFCCP questions, get them out of the way there, click submit. The best, you know, look at LinkedIn, look at their, their easy apply process. That's what you want. And I know there are probably some HR people on this call going, well, heck no. No, 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 that'll get us into too much trouble or, or you know, we've got we've, we've to get the full application. You can get the full application before they come in to, uh, to interview face-to-face. -face. They're still considered an applicant because they filled out this information according to the OFCCP, they're still an applicant. They've applied online for a position of which they are or may not be qualified, but they've applied. The short app is the way to go and more and more companies are moving towards that. If you're still having them fill out this long drawn out application, I can tell you you're losing candidates. So let's talk about assessments. And uh, I know, Nick, you have some hot sports opinions on this. So uh, let me get through this and then I'll bring you in here. Um, so 30% of the candidates with a bad assessment experience are less likely to accept a job offer. My biggest pet peeve are clients who expect candidates to take one to two hours of assessments before talking to anyone in the company. The other thought is personality assessments aren't what you can't, you, our personality assessments aren't going to judge a person to say, yes, they are a fit or are not a fit within a company, which by the way, I don't like the F word fit. I don't like that word. Uh, it's a, it, it goes, we can talk about it all day, but I'm not going to bring it up, but it just connotates or denotes very different things in people's minds. Uh, one of the assessments that, uh, that I've become certified in is UMAP because it looks at the total person. And that's what you want to be looking at. You want to look at the strengths. You want to look at what their values are. Do, those value, do their values align with the organization's values? Uh, and then their skills. What are, they most, what are the skills they want to use the most? What are the skills they don't like using? Because obviously you want them enjoying the skills that they're going to use most because then they're going to stay there longer. So I'll stop here. And uh, Nick, do you want to chime in or do you want me to, do you want me to keep going and then you want to yeah. chime in? No, I, I think it's, it's just a really fascinating area just because you obviously have all these major, you know, tech platforms, right? But you also have this upsurge now of all these smaller, more mobile uh, companies coming about. And one of them is assessments, right? And they're trying to make it easy, especially for our uh, people out there that are with, you know, large companies that get hundreds of applicants, you know, you as a recruiter, you want some way to kind of delineate. So the, the, the sales pitch is easy, but there's just so many ethical lines there. Um, and oftentimes they're not even drawn to business objectives, right? I think that's the biggest thing when you put together an assessment is that everything should be driven towards how are we helping the business, right? That's why we're here. That's why the lights are on, right? So um, that's, that was just my sense. It just seems like a really exciting area to be in, but also for those that do use assessments, it's always good to, you know, look through that, you know, are we creating a homogenous workforce where everyone's, you know, in that fit or, um, are we creating diverse workforce and this tool is helping that just always make sure to run through it, right? Look at it with the eye of the skeptic. That would just be my two cents. Yeah, no, I, I love that. So, and, and if you all, I see a couple of questions are starting to pop in about it. So really when you're looking at, and thank you. So when you're looking at them and feel free to stay on if you wanna chime in too. Um, you know, when do you give them? Are they reliable and valid, right? A lot of people say, yeah, well, we'll just do this, um, uh, especially for uh, software engineers. We'll just do this assessment. We'll, 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 we'll give them a little test. 
Well, is the test consistent? Are you asking this? Are you asking your candidates to do the same thing? Because if you're not, you're going to find yourself in hot water, right? Is it, but has it been measured to be reliable and valid? And you need to go through that process. Um, and you need to work with HR to get that done. You know, what's important for each position? Because again, if you look at the, the graphic to the right, are you looking for a leader? Are you looking for a critical thinker? Are you looking for a hard worker? Are you looking, you know, or, or, or are you looking for someone that, you know, is an emotional time bomb? Now, obviously, we're probably staying away from quadrant four. Um, but I, I would say this could even be broken down into several other parts because it's about the characteristics as much as the technical skill sets that you're looking for. The, the makeup, the genetic makeup of that person, right? That's a whole nother presentation again in itself. But still a lot of people, they wanna focus on hiring for technical skill sets. And they don't, and they, they don't, and they'll do the, the personality assessment, but they don't really say, you know, is this, is this person, you know, what are the, what are, what are the values of this person? What does this person like to be, you know, want to be doing? I think the business case scenarios, those are starting to become more commonplace. Nick, I don't know if you see that um, more and more, but I, I have seen it a lot in organizations. And um, what's your, what's your take on those business cases? Jury's out. <laughs> uh, like, like I said, it's um, it, there's so much going on in this space right now, particularly this field, um, that it's good to be involved. You know, from from a, I guess a uh, an auditing perspective, right? But uh, yeah, jury's still out for me. Yeah, and again, it needs to really be reviewed by HR and legal to make sure that uh, that it's that it's reliable and, and valid. Um, all right. So one of the, uh, you know, as far as before coming in to the interview process or to go through face-to-face -face interviews, or in this case, nowadays, virtual interviews, right? 31% of candidates receive no preparation before their interview. And that's from uh, last year's talent board. Uh, results. We're, we're waiting to get, I think they're, they're, the, the 2020s are out. Uh, if you go to talentboard.org, you can certainly see it, see it there. Um, but 31%, if you think about how many candidates we're interviewing, it actually is quite a bit. It's a, it's a huge, huge number. So, you know, my goal isn't to give them all the answers, but it's least to help them understand you know, what they're walking into. No one loves surprises, right? So it's up to us as, a rec as a recruiters to prep our candidates. So things that I do, free advice, take it or leave it. Um, uh, a candidate prep guide to help them be prepared for the tell me about yourself question, uh, how to think through their accomplishments in a star or par fashion. I include their, the names and the titles I provide LinkedIn pro links to the LinkedIn profiles uh, so that, um, uh, you know, so that they know if they can find some commonality with that person, maybe they worked at the same company or they went to the same college or university or they attended the same high school or they came from the same area. That's where you do it. So feel free uh, in the chat to kind of put how you prep candidates. I'd love to, I'd love to see the comments on that. Um, you know, one of the cool things was um, Dennis Smith, who's a talent leader at T-Mobile um, and a good friend of mine said, one of the recruiters here put together a playlist of candidates, a playlist for candidates, and they send the playlist to the candidates. If you want to see a copy of the playlist, I have it um, somewhere on my computer, DM me on LinkedIn and I'll send it to you. Um, but it's pretty cool. It's like 25, 30 songs of this, you know, you got this, let's go, you know, in the moment kind of thing. So, um, so I thought that was very creative. So obviously what's, what's super important is not only for the candidate, 
you want the hiring managers to ensure that the candidates have a good hiring experience or candidate experience, right? I have experienced this more times than I care to believe, mention. How many questions, how many times have you been asked, tell me about yourself by the same, let's say you're doing a panel, a set of panel interviews uh, of two people and you have three or four of those. Tell me about yourself, tell, you know, and they ask the same questions. No, here's some action tips that you can do. Different questions for each hiring manager. Make sure the video and the sound quality, especially for virtual are good. Make sure that they are in good lighting. Make sure they show themselves, right? So I've got a client where I do candidate experience, uh, some candidate experience consulting. And some of the feedback that I get from some of the candidates in interview is that they'll have their, uh, they'll, just, they'll just see this. Just look at my picture, it'll go away for a second. So there I'm gone, right? And so they'll talk on this. It's not very personable, is it? Make sure they show up on camera because nowadays we have, this is the way we are communicating and interviewing these days. Distractions, eliminate, you know, turn off, like before I did this presentation, I turned out, I muted all my Discord channels, my Slack channels, um, my cell phones uh, and any, I, I pretty much shut everything down. Why? Because I don't want to have oper uh, interruptions, right? So if make sure that they that uh, like we ask our candidates to be in quiet places, you need to be in a quiet place. Avoid distractions. Now I get it. The dog barks. The kids may start arguing. It's a forgiven thing, so don't worry about that. But try to eliminate as many distractions as you can. When I say company ambassador readiness. Make sure that they can talk to talk about the company, the strategic, the, st the strategy of the company, the goals of the company, uh, where the company is headed. Make sure they understand that this is where we're going, and that they can answer every question that is thrown their way. I've personally been in interviews, and I'm sure you have, where you know you'll ask a question. Well, I don't know, but let me get back on that. And the same goes for you as a recruiter. You should know as much as the hiring manager around strategy. Strategy for the organization, strategy for the, this particular department that you're recruiting for, and strategy for this position. You should know that. That's our jobs as recruiters. That's why we're the face-to-face, the, -face, the sources of the folks helping us find the candidates behind the scenes. But we as recruiters are the first point of contact and generally the last point of contact before they accept an offer or if we disposition them. Be honest with the candidates. Don't BS them. You know, make sure that there have been plenty of interviews where I'm sure that you've presented candidates. They go, you talk about the, the position and then they go in and they get a totally different viewpoint of the position from the, from the hiring manager. Number one, that should be eliminated by having your discovery call with your hiring manager. You two should be in sync on those processes and communications and what is being told about the job to the, to the actual candidates you're meeting with. If they say, is there room for growth? Have your hiring manager say right then and there, right now there's not much opportunity for growth, but it doesn't mean you need to stay in this department forever. There are other opportunities that you can go to, so there might might not be vertical opportunities, but there may be lateral opportunities for you in the organization. But if there aren't, tell them that there aren't. If you lose them, you lose them. But you're being honest and you'll be rewarded for that down the road. Make sure that they're open to candidates to connecting with them post interview and respond. So if, I, if you have an interview uh, uh, that, uh, that goes well, but they don't just have that industry experience and they want that industry experience. Your hiring managers and you as the recruiter should be open to um, the candidates going, hey, you know, I appreciate the conversation. Can we set up a quick 15 minute call about maybe some suggestions you have? And if you have the time then take it then or get it scheduled. Make sure your hiring managers are doing the same thing because it just shows that you're willing to help somebody. Allow for questions 
uh, allow, make sure they allow time for questions and they educate their candidates so they can make a decision about joining the company. So the key is around you know, communications and being open and honest with them. And answer, ask, of obviously, besides asking the right questions, and that's, again, we're not gonna go through an interview prep call, uh, but you know what I'm, you know, most of you have experienced this and understand where I'm coming from on this. So empathetic communication and follow-up. So treat talent as customers, not as candidates. And I'll tell you why in a short bit here. One of the things that we had at Freeman in the American Heart Association that we would publish on our site, at least when I was there, was a candidate bill of rights. And it was up to me and my team to make sure that these candidate bill of rights were met with regard to respect, responsiveness, clarity, and timeliness, right? If you wanna be even better than that, you can say, we commit to providing timely follow-up within 24 hours to your emails and voicemails. I know most of you probably are going, what are you kidding? I get it. But at least show that you're, 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 you're focusing, that, they, that you're acknowledging them that they're not a transaction, that they're a long-term customer, whether they're uh, uh, applying for jobs or they take another job and they have potential buying power and, uh, and, and could buy products or services from your organization. When it comes to offers, it's, it's really about offering the, offering the job that the candidate really, really interviewed for, right? What is it that, uh, that, that uh, when you, uh, I've seen many a times that Companies will say, well, we've, here's the position, you're gonna interview for the position. Then it comes time for the offer and they say, well, you know, I think that we're probably gonna downgrade this position or we're gonna upgrade this position. Oh yeah, or we're gonna downgrade this position. Um, so would you be interested in that? What do you think the answer is gonna be? If you're, if you're talking about changing the position, you really need to hit reset and start over. Don't bait and switch the candidates. And that, uh, that, that has happened uh, in a few conversations that I've had where they've interviewed for one position and they thought that they were interviewing for that position and they go, well, you know, most people can't, don't come in externally and start to grow into this position. And then um, uh, and then, so you, you, you start here and then you'll work your way up. Okay, I'll take that. Come to find out when they're all in training together, what happens? People start talking. They meet, uh, you know, a manager and they say, oh, well, how long have you been with, uh, you know, such and such company? Oh, I was just hired. What? Oh, I, I thought they only promoted from within to management. No, that, that doesn't seem to be the case. What does that do to your reputation? Am I going to stay very long? Probably not. <laughs> offer the salary. This in, so in talking about offering the, uh, the job, offer the salary within the salary you all discussed. You can ask for a salary range. You just can't ask in some states, most in, I don't know how many, a third of the states about their salary history. But make sure that you land within their range, whether it be on the low side, the middle or the high side. Because again, if they're interviewing for a $65,000 job and they understand that and they've asked you, am I within range? And you said yes in the initial phone screen, then you come back and say, well, I think we're gonna offer this at 50K. Kent's not gonna accept your offer. There's, the trust has been broken. And that's what I mean by being transparent. Be transparent throughout the entire process. It goes a lot further. Close before the verbal offer. 
get them to get your candidates to commit that this is the job that they're super excited about, right? Because you've been up front with them, now they need to be up front. And if they come back to you and say, hey, you know, I'm interviewing with some other companies, I'm not ready to, to say that if I got an offer I'd accept today, okay, that's fine, at least you know that. And say, what would it take you to not consider those other opportunities? Ask the right questions. Build a trusting and long lasting relationship with the candidates. Whether they take this job or don't take this job, they could come back again. Or you could be interviewing for, their, for a role with them in the, in the future. Think about that. It all goes back to the brand slide that I showed you. It's about your personal brand and your, your and not only your personal brand as a recruiter, your personal brand as a person and your overall arching employer brand. So what's most important here? Really, it's the bottom line. So let's talk about the business impact of candidate experience. 41%, this is from the talent board, 41% of job seekers who give their overall candidate ex experience a negative one-star rating will definitely take their alliances, product purchases, and relationships somewhere else. And I got a story to share with you in a minute. 64% of the job seekers who rate it a positive rating and experience will continue to have brand loyalty and will continue to apply for your roles. So here's the story. I interviewed with an organization in 2018. I went through, and I'm not kidding, 14 interviews, 14, one, four. It took eight months. This is a, this is a, uh, uh, started out as a director of talent acquisition. They changed to a VP of talent acquisition. They ended up hiring somebody else. And the reason why they did it was like, well, we decided to hire someone that had that talent management experience. And I get it needs change, but let me know, you know, five months in that that is something you're looking for and then cut me off. Not eight months down the road, maybe even you know, three months, figure it out, right? So it was a, uh, a, a auto repair, national auto repair chain. Fast forward to last year, you have this big windstorm in Dallas, huge branch falls on my car, damages the windshield, the hood. I need car repair. Who do you think I went to? I didn't go to the one where it was an eight month, 14 interview process. I went to their direct competitor and they got my, you know, they got my 15, $1,700 after insurance. I'm only one person and you say, well, yeah, it's only $1,700. Okay, if I'm having that kind of experience, or other, other people for sure are having that experience, and I can tell you the dollar signs add up. So uh, I'm a huge fan of the talent board. And when you go to their, uh, go to their site, they have a uh, talent board resentment calculator. That's cool. This is an active, this is an active uh, calculator. You can put it in. So let's say annually you have a thousand hires. Each app, you have a hundred applicants per hire and the average customer monetary value of what I'm gonna spend at your company if I'm loyal to your brand is a hundred bucks, all right? So we reject 99 candidates uh, per hire, which means we, re we reject 99,000 candidates over the course of a year. Let's say for the residence factor, I have a I'm in the I'm in this 41%. Uh, and I go and tell one person. Well, according to this, I've told 40 people this story. You know, to cause action. Right? So your total rejected candidate audience just doubled to 198,000 people. 
candidate audience, right? Let's say there's a 7% annual resentment rate. And this is based on the benchmarks from talent board who are willing to sever the business relationship. They're just, they're like me. They go, I had such a bad experience. I'm not going to go do that. I'm, I'm not giving them my business. This is real money, folks. You potentially lost 13,860 customers. And at the same time, as you've offered a bad experience, even though it's not real money, it's potential revenue for the company. So whether it's your hiring manager, whether it's you, whether it's just something happened that just didn't go well during the process, you've cost the company at least 1.3 million. And I know there are companies on this call that hire a lot more than a thousand people a year. So stew on that. You can go to uh, talent again. Go to the talent board. Go to talentboard.org, and you'll find this in there. Or just or just Google talent board resentment calendar. This this, this you want to get you want to get your uh, your executive's attention. Bingo. And you have your real numbers. Let's say you're a services company. Where you where where you know the average cost, uh, let's say your 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 workday or SAP or Oracle, and your customer monetary value is two hundred and fifty thousand, or two hundred thousand. Boy, that sure. Now you're talking billions. So, something something to really resonate on. So. Talking to the leaders, if you're not a leader, still pay attention because this is something that you can, uh, can definitely take to them and share with them uh, in terms of your talent acquisition or HR leadership teams. But there are three tools um, that I've used uh, when I was in the corporate recruiting setting uh, and that I ask my clients, I, I present them as, here you go. One, it's a scorecard. The second is a, is a playbook down there at the bottom. And then the third is to map out the candidate journey and the communication touch points that we talked about uh, up at the beginning of the conversation, probably slide 10 or 11 when, you, when you're looking at it, right? So let's look at that. So the SCAR card, it's for recruiters and hiring managers. And you're thinking, well, wait a minute, hiring managers, that could be a gotcha moment. It's not a gotcha moment, it's more of a, hey, here's, here's how, we're, here's how you're, we're performing. Here's what candidates are saying about us as it relates to candidate experience. They didn't feel you gave them good enough information in order for them to say, yeah, I wanna work here. Or you misquoted something. Or they were great. You can have simple scorecards. For recruiters, it's the same thing. Company overview, job explanation, interview process, follow-up, uh, you know, my recruiter treated me with respect, employment brand, the net promoter score, right? Will you, how likely would you recommend, in this case, DocuSign to others, right? You know, provide reports and updates. We used to do it on a monthly basis. We did hiring manager satisfaction, and we did candidate satisfaction surveys every month, every month to people we spoke with, whether they got the job or not. We talked to everybody. You want to tie, you know, it's putting it out there, but maybe tie the scorecard, at least on the recruiter side, to their performance bonus. But the most important thing you do is your support network. You know, if, you, if you're lucky enough to have recruiting coordinators, put the onus on them to take care of the admin side of letting candidates know by phone calling the candidates that you've spoken with. Don't, don't email candidates that you've spoken with and say, I'm sorry, it doesn't, we're not moving forward. That's not good. But hold each other accountable as fellow recruiters. Hold, the hire, hold your hiring managers accountable. You are their consultants. You should be holding them accountable. The candidate journey, ask how and where do we connect and how do we communicate? What are those touch points? Are we using humans or are we using machines? 
you know, for those that use chatbots. Determine where the candidate drops off, which most ATSs these days should be able to tell you, and how re recruiting can re-engage to finish the process. Are you sending, it's kind of like when you, you know, we've all done it. We've been on um, Amazon or Instagram and we've, you know, we've uh, hit the clickbait. And then, you know, when you, you know, it, it feeds off your email data and says, hey, I saw you started a certain process. How would you like to finish that? You know, I saw you started to buy, you know, a new, a new camera, right? It comes back to you. They come back to you. You need to figure out how to do that. And there, and there are ways to do that. It goes back to treating candidates like customers and create a separate sourcing slash research, whatever you're calling it these days, journey. So if you've got a recruiting, you know, recruiter journey and you wanna embed the sourcing process in here, fine. I personally think they're two distinctly different functions and should have their own roadmap on communication. Now, big debate, if the sourcer is just name generating then it's up to the recruiters to say yes or no, we're not gonna move forward with them. You could argue that if the recruiter says, no, I'm not gonna accept these candidates, can you just let them know? Well, they probably haven't talked to them in the first place. So no, that's not how it works, right? So find ways to be better. As far as a playbook, it's an online document. Uh, and I, I put one together wherever I've worked, but it helps do the following. It gives an overall view of the candidate journey it goes, this goes to recruiters and hiring managers, so everybody's on the same page. It ensures consistency in the way our communication points and how we're communicating, the tools that we're using. It's all transparent on the inside so that you can be transparent on the outside. Um, outlining expectations and accountabilities. Here are the recruiter, here's what the recruiters are responsible for. Here's what the hiring managers are responsible for. It's in black and white, folks. They can't argue with you. It includes those candidate touch points that we talked about. It includes a marketing plan. I include user guides for all the tools that we have, right? So once I onboard a recruiter or I onboard a hiring manager, I can sit down with them and show them this. And it's a desktop reference. So in the end, you know, the, there's, you know, the candidates, this, I, this was some real survey data Here's what folks had said. Uh, I never had a feeling where I left the interview and knew I wanted to work at Client X. Um, and, and then on the far right down at the bottom, I could tell the hiring manager had taken the time to review my resume, right? And then you can see this, uh, read some of those comments there. So practical tips to start now. Try to set the expectation you were gonna return calls and emails within a 72 to 90 hour time frame. Designate a day like a follow up Friday. I know a few companies that do this on Fridays. Their job is to get back to every single candidate that has responded to them, either rejecting them or letting updating them on where they are in process. Same with hiring managers and communication uh, touch points there. Um, be open and honest from beginning to the end, right? In terms of the role, the direct company direction, the comp. Create a candidate bill of rights. Uh, feel free to use the one I, sh I showed you on the slide deck there. Um, educate and train your hiring managers. So recruiters and hiring managers are in sync and they're going along the same process so they can ensure a smooth candidate experience process. And then do candidate satisfaction surveys. Measure your results. I strongly encourage you to do the candies, the candidate, North American candidate experience. If you're in a me and APAC, you should do those there as well. But don't just do the once a year survey and fix things. Track along the way, because you can make tweaks so that when it comes time to filling out your, getting your survey done, because they reach out to those candidates for their feedback and they send them a survey, you'll know where you stand, right? So what questions can I answer? I think we're in, in good on time. Yeah, we are. Yep, yep. We have about five minutes. Uh, so our uh, first question from uh, Bruce Ruthie, uh, how to attract talent for a stealth mode startup 
or you can't give a lot of information on the job post. Sorry, one more time. How do you what? Yeah, so uh, so this would be more on, on the top of that talent funnel, right? So how do how are we going to attract talent when, as a startup, we're in a stealth mode? Um, so we can't really put too much information in our job postings. So you know, and just how are we hiring and putting it out there? So giving a positive candidate experience, letting you know, hey, because you went you went and you talked about everything that needs to be in that job description. So how how do you kind of mirror or you know straddle both sides of that? Yeah, that's a good. That's a great question. Uh, thank you. So um, first and foremost, I would say, give what you you know, divulge what you can divulge. Don't use real names if you can. If you're in stealth mode, to say, hey, look, we've got top talent. You know, be transparent. We're in stealth mode. We're growing, and we're we're going to be, and we need to hire some staff before we go public. Not public stock. I'm talking about public in general. But here's some of the cool, you know, if you can divulge some of the projects they're working on, uh, if you can divulge um, or communicate, you know, what, what are some of the core responsibilities are without making it sound like a job description, like really just kind of telling, here, here's some of the things you're going to get to be doing, you know, and by the way, here's some of the experience that you'll need to have in your background. And you know we'll we'll give you a call. So I think that's it, it's probably the best way. Take it, you know it's, I'm not trying to skirt the answer, but I, I think that's the best way to do it. It's really um, be as open as you can, and just uh, uh, and and try to talk about some of the projects in a very vague way. That say hey you know if you're qualified and we talk to you, you're going to know more. You know let them know that at the end. And just to build on that. It, absolutely, Michael. Because I, I mean, I understand you. You want to. Uh, you don't want to give away too much there. You, I think what ultimately you want to do is talk about things that you can't talk about, right? Talk about your values. Talk about what excites you. And everyone at that startup, you're there for a reason, right? You're there for a purpose. What are you trying to solve? Maybe you can't bring up the exact, uh, you know, business strategy or model that you're going for, but you can bring up those aspects, I believe, um, and that's something that would excite me as a job seeker. Right. And just always be mindful of how much content you're putting out there. You know, you don't want to, you know, to someone to read a huge book. Um, but talk about the talk about things that you can talk about and things that are important to you. Um, you know, that that's that's what I would say. And we did have a second question, Michael, uh, from Harris. So what is the incentive for an HR person to keep improving the application experience uh, and also to keep refining the system to get the right candidate? So what's the right process? What is the, the incentive? So, and I think, you know, what they're trying to say is, you know, because from my standpoint, you HR should really be over here and TA should really be controlling that process. In right. communication with HR, there shouldn't be a divide. But um, so maybe just talking about, you know, how can HR support talent acquisition in refining that process? Maybe that might be a way to phrase that. Sure. So... So here's the one thing that I will say around candidate experience and that where HR and recruiting should be in sync. And that's, look, if you're having trouble getting a, a hiring manager to respond within a certain time frame because you wanna ensure the candidate experience uh, is, 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 you know, is required, um, uh, then you need to get your you know, partner with your generalist to have them have those conversations. But I think the recruiting leaders and the HR leaders should be meeting you know, especially if you report up into a chief people officer role or report to a chief people officer role, you want to make sure that you're here, here are the things that are going well. Here are the things that need attention. Here's, here's what I, and, and, sh and do the, show them the calculator, do, walk through a calculator and show them the, you know, what happens if we don't address these issues? What is the potential? And I go, well, that's not real. Actually, it is real because people will take their business elsewhere if they're not having a positive candidate experience. So it's really aligning and partnering just as much as you partner with the business to partner with your HR people and understand and make sure that candidate experience is a part of the strategic direction of the overall HR strategy if you are reporting into HR. If you have your own talent strategy, that should be one of your top, top goals. But it's really talking to people in numbers 
that gets people thinking. Why? Because it could affect their bonus, right? If my chief people officer doesn't meet his or her requirements or doesn't meet their goal because we put in there that this was a strategic goal of the company and it's our hiring managers and it's our some maybe some of our recruiters that aren't doing a good job holding up their end of the bargain, it directly affects their bottom line. It affects your bottom line as a recruiter and it affects the, your manager's bottom line as a recruiting leader. Does that help? Yeah, I, and the only other thing that really came up was just scalability uh, where, and I, I get it because we were talking about reaching out to every single person. Um, and if I can real quick, Michael, the only thing I'd want to say on that is, you know, within human resources, you know, sometimes we have to take out some of the human to get more human, right? So looking at automation tools that can start taking care of that busy work to give recruiters more time to focus on those relationships, right? But, you know, what are your thoughts on the scalability, Michael? And then we'll close out there. Yeah, so um, I think if you don't, if, if the answer is we don't have time, then you need to look at automation tools. You know, are, will chatbots help me? Well, when it comes to applying for positions, yes, it will help you um, because, you, you know, I can type in uh, HR positions in the U.S., or HR positions or marketing positions in you know, the UK. It pulls up those list of positions right away. I click on it, I can apply. If you can work with your ATS systems and there are ATS systems that can provide um, candidates updates on where they are in process. So when I move you from applied to reviewed resume, you'll know that you've moved in the step. So you can go back to that chat bot, either you can send an automated email to go, hey, congratulations, your resume is being reviewed. LinkedIn does this this way, right? If you've ever applied to LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. um, where, it, where it stops though is, hey, you're gonna get a phone call, right? It doesn't know that. But if, if I move it from, from review resume to phone screen, we should have something, you should be able to build out your chat bot so that you can go, where am I in the process? Where's, you know, I applied for X, where, where am I in the process? Look, the technology gets more sophisticated every single day and it should be able to pull out that, that type of information to say, all right, you're in review resume process, right? Or you're gonna be getting a call from a recruiter. If that call doesn't come, then it's up to the candidate to maybe follow up and say, hey, I got an update saying I was gonna get a call for a phone screen. Uh, can we get that set up, right? And it's up to our jobs to figure out what do we have time for? So like I said, create that follow-up Friday in terms of scalability. Don't think you got to go, you know, you know, throw the Hail Mary and get the touchdown. Start in small steps. Start with follow-up Fridays. If you need to be, if you need to think about it, hire an HR coordinator. If you're a small company, out, outsource that uh, candidate experience to somebody. Let somebody do that for you or hire a temp, especially during your busy seasons. Because remember, what, if you can provide, if you have someone giving a personal touch to somebody, that, go, that, that, that let's say 25,000, 30,000 you're spending on the temp to get back to folks is a lot better than a, a $1.3 million hit to the bottom line. With that said, we're gonna have to, Cut it there, but we do appreciate everyone's time. Everyone will get a copy of the slide deck today. Uh, everyone will get a copy of the recording that registered with us. Um, and, you know, as always, ATAP, really proud to have you guys here. Really happy to have you guys here. We're going to have more live streams coming up next month, the following months, focusing on, like I said, individual contributors, like sourcing tactics, recruiting tactics, recruitment marketing tactics to leadership whether that's DNI, performance management, uh, to then innovation and technology. You know, what's going on? Who's doing the new thing? So please continue to stay tuned. We appreciate it. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everybody.